Africa. Africa, not so much as a political or a geopolitical statement, but as an economic statement. What can we learn uh, from the underserved? This is a concept that we have learned throughout all of these GIOs as we've been doing them. The idea of micro-commerce maybe needs to be taken to a new, new level, namely nano-commerce. And then the security and society uh, issues that are going to face us all as we all rapidly become members of a globally integrated economy. When that happens, uh, your data starts to move in all kinds of directions. Who governs, who governs the globe? Uh, while you're a citizen of India, or you're a citizen of France, or you're a citizen of Germany. How does that work as things move from border to border? You get the picture? This is an entirely different process for an engineer. For an engineer. You know, an electrical engineer who actually did real honest work for a living at one time, you know, in IBM. I'm a circuit, a chip, and a computer designer. And here I am talking about something way up here, not something way down here. Because we actually believe that in order to generate, I'll say it again, real value in the 21st century, do what our company wants to do, continue to grow and continue to lead and continue to help our clients, we've got to look for it in different places and not just driving technology, not just driving invention, not just driving in cre a creation or discovery. Having said that, uh, let me give you a brief, brief uh, perspective on what indeed we do mean when we talk about innovation for the enterprise, small, medium, or large. I said it's not just product and services, it's processes, it's business models, and yes, it's societal as well. And I'm just going to touch on each of these briefly to give you a sense for the culture that we're trying to build in IBM, for the, for the feeling we want people to have about this topic of innovation. This is not easy, as you understand. Taking a country that's almost, or company that's almost 100 years old, has a culture of technology, has a pride in invention, creation, and discovery, you know, has five Nobel laureates for 14 years in a row, has the most patents, you know, issued in the United States by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. I mean, and then to say to them all, okay, that's good. That's kind of jacks are better to open if you play cards. Or if you're in college, that's no longer the necessary and sufficient condition. It's a condition, but you've got to do more. That's a cultural challenge, by the way. Um, so they're responding. A little bit about high-performance computing, not to make you all high-performance computing wizards. The only reason I want to talk about this thing is this is the world's fastest supercomputer. This is the world's uh, best and, and uh, most capable high-performance computing platform anywhere in the world. I'm proud of it. Our research people developed it. Do you know why I'm proud of it, though? Because they developed it with not the leading-edge technology, not next year's technology. They developed it with N-2 technology. Stuff that it, that's pedestrian, stuff that's in your watches, it's in your cell phone, it's in your DVD. How did they do that? How do you make the world's biggest supercomputer with crap? In quotes. My research people would go nuts if they ever heard me say that. How do you do that? You do that by looking for a different opportunity, looking at the problem differently. You step back and you view it from an entirely different perspective. And if they weren't edgy on this topic of innovation, they never would have done that. 